Rory McKiernan here. You're all very, very welcome. I see we have almost 300 people here on Zoom from all over the world, from all over Ireland and all over the world, including South Africa, joining us here for this very, very special and momentous um, event. It's entitled The Celebration of the Life of Desmond Tutu. And indeed, it is a celebration, but we are cognizant that it is also a sad time for many and many who knew him personally. And I think we want to offer sincere condolences to all his friends and his family. I suppose like many others, when I woke up and heard the news of his passing, I felt moved in a number of ways, but mainly what I, I did is I felt moved to, to have a conversation, to, to see about doing something. And I suppose that's for me, the legacy imparted by my memory of Desmond Tutu is the need to do, to act. And so that, within minutes, uh, became a conversation with my friend Joe Murray from AFRI. And indeed, Desmond Tutu was a good friend to Joe, a good friend to AFRI, and was his patron alongside his wife, Leah, over many decades. Um, so Joe gave the nod, and a few days later, here we are, uh, several hundred of us, and including people joining us live on Facebook as well. So I'd encourage you all to settle in for what's going to be a very, very special event. Some wonderful speakers, some poetry and some music and some stories and some reflection as well. And I'd encourage you to use the chat facility. Um, I'd encourage you to use the chat facility to tell us where you're joining from and if you'd like to share any memories or reflections. Um, we do have some issues in our Zoom room with a few people that are named as anonymous. So we have our security settings um, marked around that and we're keeping an eye on things. Um, we don't expect any issues whatsoever, but in the event that anything did go wrong, we would be emailing you a new link um, within a couple of minutes. Um, but we don't expect that anything would go wrong in that regard. So. Um, please do use the comment facilities and the chat facilities on Facebook or on Zoom and tell us where you're joining from. Um, my first memory of Desmond Tutu was in 2009 in NUI Galway in the university there when I first heard him speak. And I suppose at the time, uh, what was that now, 11 years ago or so, um, at the time, I suppose, like many people, I was looking for uh, inspiration and looking for leadership and looking for moral compass and, and examples of leadership in the world that really hold uh, the highest values of, of justice, of peace, of equality and of truth. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that many of us know people that espouse and hold those values, but the true giants in the world are so rare and to to come across them, to behold them, to witness them, to listen to them is such a privilege and a gift. And I, I feel that in my heart now, I can remember that day and just being lit up and feeling the energy coming off the man. And we're going to be hearing stories now from Joe Murray and from several other speakers. We're being, we've a very special, relatively last minute announcement in that Father Michael Lapsley is joining us live from South Africa and he would be well known to Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela and many others. And then we have music by Colin McEnumera, we have poetry uh, by Sarah Clancy and by Nandi Yola. Uh, we have some music by Tommy Sands, we have Bulalani from Massey, another good South African here. And a big special welcome to all the South Africans. It's a, I know it's a, it's a big week for you all. Uh, we have Fatin from the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Uh, we have Mary Manning from the Dunn Store Strikers. So a really great lineup. I'm a little bit uh, concerned that I'm going to forget somebody, but I'll try not to. Uh, as I said, this has all been put together over a couple of days during the Christmas period. So we'll try and ensure a smooth, uh, a smooth show and uh, hopefully everything go well. So I'm going to invite now Joe Murray onto the screen. Joe Murray is the coordinator of AFRI which is a small but very significant peace and human rights and justice organization that has been going over many decades. And Desmond Tutu was the patron of AFRI. So Joe, I'd like to invite you to begin by uh, telling us, maybe you could introduce AFRI to those that are new to AFRI, but also then introduce the relationship between AFRI and Desmond Tutu. 
Yeah, well, thanks very much, Rory, and I'm delighted that you took the initiative on this and started the ball rolling and, you know, brought us to the point where we have all these people joining us tonight on this very significant occasion to mark the passing of a hero, of a moral giant. It's hard to find superlatives because they have all been used during this week, but he was without doubt an exceptional man and one that we in AFRI were privileged to know uh, and to have as our as our patron. Um, and, you know, I was talking to Michael Lapsley, whom we will be hearing later, and um, he, you know, I thought he, he summed it up um, very well when I said, it's a sad day, and he said, we are full of grief and, and gratitude. And I think that that is a good summary uh, as, as to how, certainly as to how I feel and as to how we in AFRI feel. Um, yeah, AFRI is a very small, uh, as Rory said, Justice and Peace Organization founded in 1975. And we focus on many issues, uh, particularly the issue of militarization and war, uh, climate change and the forced uh, migration of people. Um, many of whom arrive in Ireland and end up in the terrible system of direct provision. And uh, I'm sure Bulalani will refer to that later on. Um, but uh, our, our connection with, with Desmond Tutu began in 1984 when he came to speak at a conference. We, in fact, had invited him in 1982. And, uh, but he, believe it or not, the South African government refused to allow him to, to travel. It, it's kind of hard to imagine that, but that was, that was the system of apartheid, that he was refused permission to travel. But as soon as the ban on his travel was lifted in 1984, he came and took up the invitation that we had issued two years previously. And he spoke in Sean McDermott Street to a packed audience. And as Rory said, for me, it was absolutely a moment of awakening. I knew about um, apartheid. But to hear it described in such a forceful and articulate way was quite extraordinary. Um, so, and you know, following that, we uh, we stayed in contact. He agreed to be the patron of Afri, and you know, it was extraordinary to the extent to which um, he was available to us. That we could contact him. He would always reply. He would always respond. And I think that's part of the greatness of the man, that he was a statesman. He was known around the world internationally, but he always had time for, for the small person or for the small organization or for wherever he saw uh, human rights being uh, violated. I saw the lovely quotes and lovely, you know, uh, little stories there at the start in the video. One that he's told when he spoke that time in John McDermott Street, which has always stayed with me, was that he talked about, you know, uh, he was talking about apartheid and he was saying that the way he described it was if an elephant is standing on a mouse's foot, you don't ask the elephant is the mouse uh, hurting, you ask the mouse. And I think that's a very powerful image because in so many parts of the world, we hear the voice of the elephant, the, the voice of the oppressor and we don't hear the voice of the oppressed. And I think that that's what he was great at doing. And that's what we in AFRI tried to do as a small organization is to amplify that voice where we can. Um, he came, that was 1984, he came again in 1991 to lead the famine walk. And, you know, again, I was struck there by one of the quotes. I remember him saying when he led the famine walk that, we seem to have learned nothing at all from history, that we just keep on repeating the same mistakes. On Gurthamore is over in Ireland at the moment, but on Gurthamore our hunger is happening in, in other parts of the world. So we, we, we fail to learn the lessons of history, unfortunately. And then he came again in 2005 and he, that was after his 30th anniversary, and he came and he was a guest speaker in the Royal College of Surgeons. It was a huge venue, but we needed that venue. So uh, there were so many people interested in, in hearing his voice. He and Rose Hogan spoke, or Rose Kelly, sorry, from Donegal spoke at that event, both memorable, most mem memorable speeches. Um, 
and and you know he had expressed solidarity with many of the issues that we were involved in and particularly the one of the war industry and its impact on people and planet and i suppose for me the one that's uh, that's the issue that maybe is most neglected that we do not take on board the threat that the war industry poses to us and i am particularly saddened and very few things have saddened me to this extent that just before Christmas, after the COP26, the Irish government announced that Ireland was to become a, 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 um, a maker of weapons, that we're going, to, we're going to join the weapons industry. They, had, they invited small and medium-sized uh, companies to come to a meeting where they would be uh, put in touch with existing arms manufacturers in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. So in order to develop a weapons industry in the Republic of Ireland, and I think that that is absolutely absurd and it is grotesque, really. If we look at the world today and we, you know, we ask the question, what does the world need? The very last thing it needs is more weapons. The world is awash with weapons and it is an obscenity that the Irish government, that Michal Martin, that Simon Coveney and that Eamon Ryan are leading us willingly and consciously into this evil trade. And I would hope that from tonight, that would be one thing that would come is that, you know, we're trying, I think what we need to do now is carry forward the legacy of Desmond Tutu. And one of his legacies is his opposition to weapons and to war making. And, you know, it would be great if, if people in Ireland made it clear to our leaders that this is not a route that we need to go we need to go in the direction of peacemaking and disarmament, not adding more weapons to an already flooded market of weapons. So, um, yeah, uh, Rory, I don't know what time I have left you, uh, but oh, you're on silent there, Rory. Yeah, you have uh, you have a good 30 seconds there, Joe. <laughs> good 30 seconds. OK, well, I'll tell you on a lighter note, um, and this has been referred to one of the, one of I suppose my most memorable experiences was bringing Desmond Tutu for a pint in in the Abbey Mooney in in uh, in Abbey Street in Dublin. We asked him after he gave that speech and that, uh, you know, Sean McLaren, is there anything you'd like to do? He said, I'd like to have a pint of Guinness. So we went into the Abbey Mooney and I've, I've written about this. This young guy was staring over at us and eventually he came over and he said, I'm about to go to Africa as a, a development worker. And I cannot believe that my all time hero is sitting in the pub having a pint on the night before uh, before I traveled. So he, he was an incredibly human, entertaining, passionate, lovable, um, warm, um, you know, it's it's hard to find sufficient adjectives to describe him, and it certainly a light has gone out with his passing, but it is for us now to keep that light burning, and the people that we will hear tonight are the people who are doing that, and we need to support those in order to keep his flame burning. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much. And we'll be hearing from Joe again a little bit later. So we'll move along, folks. And thanks for all the great comments in the chat. I actually, be honest, I can't keep up with them all. I'm seeing uh, people from all over Ireland and elsewhere joining us. Uh, but we'll, we will try and keep a look at the comments and encourage Joe and the AFRI team to keep a look. We have great support from Raj Whelan here as well. Uh, in the background. So um, we're going now to the north of the island. We're going um, it's uh, it's a story of Port Stewart, South Africa, to Portadown, from Port Stewart to Portadown, and it's a story of poetry and power. And this is a woman I encountered a few weeks ago, just online, doing some research into poets, and I came across uh, Nandi Jola, and uh, I just knew there is a person I'd like to connect with again. And lo and behold, just a few weeks later. Um, I got to send her a message and she agreed to take part um, in this event. So I'm very excited to, to hear her uh, perform some of her poetry. And I'm going to now uh, bring her on screen if everything goes well here. So here we have Nandi. You're very welcome, Nandi. <laughs> 
the arch friend of the irish people world icon for the truth and reconciliation ubuntu is the legacy you instilled that was a cheeky haiku roy i didn't say to you that i was going to start with that uh so i just want to thank you roy uh, because you've been constantly uh, in con communication with myself and uh, been reassured and thank you for this opportunity. And also I would like to th say thank you to Afri and Joe and thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be reading. I can see uh, my fellow poet, uh, Sarah Clancy is here as well. And I say hello to you, Sarah. We met uh, virtually, <laughs> we'll meet in, in person, I hope. My first poem, Elegy for Nyawonte Desmond Dodo. At midnight on Christmas day, the lamp was burning low. The women sat at the foot of the bed. Men sat on his right side, holy book and hymns to his left. His cross rested between his hands, the elders in shrouds. When his hour came, the woman opened the balm each marking a cross on his weakening muscles. The men started to bend the incense. A bell rang once, then a minute silence followed by wailing. By dawn, men in chasubles appeared, each passing through the mist of the incense the heavy hearts and bowed heads. They adorned the arch in purple silk robes, closed his eyes and blessed his soul. Lala got all of that at all fizzle, um, the mom, she was a meal. Tapestry of love. Let us give love a chance to give our children hope of a world without hatred where black and white walk hand in hand. Let the peace walls come down so that the ghosts of apartheid, the troubles, Holocaust, farming and genocides can be finally laid to rest for history to remain history only to be found in books on shelves Stories must be told by those who are victorious. Together, let us dance to freedom. Emancipate to one song, one celebration, one love. For we are one race of many colors, many voices, many dreams, one unity, one heart, a tapestry of love. Hello, Mazui. It is to the gun, a clang along a shio, that's all fizzily, um, the momshe, or Zamile, Yawanshe. Thank you so much, Nandi. That was powerful, powerful. Um, you can't hear it, such as the nature of many online events, but there's a lot of applause and appreciation for you being felt here and including in the chat and on Facebook as well. So I think people will be checking you out uh, and your work. And I believe you have a book coming out in or a publication in the next year or so, or is it is it next year? Yeah, uh, my my publisher is in, is in, I think is in Goway. It's Doya Press. It's in Connemara actually. So uh, yeah, I've got my book coming out in the spring. So look out for it. Brilliant. I look forward to that. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll be in Galway anyway in April for the Koch Festival. So hope to see everybody there. Excellent. Thanks again. OK, folks, so we'll keep moving because we have a very full schedule here. So I just do want to keep an eye on the time as well. And um, we were originally due to go for an hour. Um, the, I won't say it's bad news because it's certainly not bad news, but it's, it's good news that the event is going to be probably an, an extra 20 minutes because we've those extra uh, additions to the lineup and some that I didn't mention are uh, you might see them there on your screen Mary and Willie Cardoff coming live from County Mayo I calling them the love boards at the moment because they look very cozy on the couch there <laughs> sorry people are going to be going looking for you now in the gallery to see on the zoom um <laughs> 
Anyway, it's good to see a bit of romance there and um, a good a bit of positivity in the air. And I think we might all agree that these are very challenging times for people. And there's a lot of um, a lot of people are struggling right now and we need to be mindful of that. And I think that's an additional reason to have community gatherings. Whilst, you know, the physical social gatherings that we know may not be possible right at this minute, I think it doesn't stop us from gathering and creating this spirit that Desmond Tutu is so famous for. And the other aspect that I associate with him is joy and that big smile. When I went searching for photos of him to share as part of the publicity for this event, I came across so many that were joy filled and to see an activist and a social leader and political leader and indeed a religious leader actually smile in the course of doing what they do. It's it's a radical act in its own right. So let's have a bit more smiling in the world and a bit more community and a bit more solidarity where we look after each other more during these testing times. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a very special guest. Indeed, everyone's a special guest tonight, including anyone joining us. Um, but we're going to go live now to South Africa to Father Michael Lapsley, who uh, I think should be here. Um, I'm just going to check he's here. Michael, how are you doing? You're very welcome. Fine, thank you. And it's good to be with you. It's good to be with Joe. It's good to be with Afri. Um, and I, I think there are many old friends and comrades here that I'd be very happy to be with face to face. And incidentally, um, about two hours ago, I was with Mary Robinson, um, who, of course, has spoken before at Afri events, and she's in Cape Town for the funeral. And we were at a memorial uh, this evening, an event celebrating the life of, of Desmond Tutu. And your ears should have been burning because we were speaking about Afri together just about two hours ago. Good to hear. It's great. And it, it does come to mind that the, the links between Ireland and South Africa, Ireland, North and South and South Africa are so strong. And I think these are links that we want to sustain and maintain and continue. So it's great to have you here. And hopefully we'll have you here in person before too long. Michael, for those that don't know you or your story, I believe you're originally a New Zealander. Um, but can you tell people a little bit about your own backstory and how over the years it came to be associated or you came to be associated with the ANC and in particularly the struggle against apartheid? No, thank you very much. Well, it's, what you're saying is true. I'm a, I'm a Kiwi boy um, by birth. Um, and a uh, Kiwi boy who became a South African, who became a Southern African. I'm still a Southern African, but also uh, an internationalist uh, as well. Um, but I was uh, joined the Anglican Religious Order in Australia, who sent me to South Africa in 1973. After the Soweto uprising, I was expelled from South Africa. I went to live in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, that tiny country completely surrounded by South Africa. And it was there that I, I joined the African National Congress of South Africa. So I was to spend the next 16 years outside South Africa, first in Lesotho, then in Zimbabwe. And at the same time, I was a pastor, priest, chaplain uh, within the liberation movement. And then, in, um, and of course, it was in Lesotho I first met Desmond Tutu. I was expelled from South Africa in September 76. In late 75, he had become the bishop of Lesotho. And so that's where we met, 1975, and we remained connected all through these years to eternity. Then he was my Archbishop of Cape Town. And then when he was chairperson of the commission, uh, I gave evidence to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, but then taking, just pausing a step, uh, April of 1990, three months after the release of Nelson Mandela, I received a letter bomb in the post from, from the apartheid government. So that's how I lost both my hands. I lost an eye, my eardrums were shattered many other injuries. So of course, I traveled my own journey of healing through the love and prayers of people of goodwill uh, from across the world. And, uh, and then um, I actually, firstly, after I returned to South Africa, I became chaplain to a trauma center for victims of violence and torture uh, under Archbishop um, you know, Tutu. But just to tell a little tidy story, after I was bombed, I went to hospital in Australia. I came back from hospital in Australia, 
to Zimbabwe. I came to my bishop and I said, well, Father, here I am. He said, but you are disabled now. What can you do? I said, I can drive a car. He looked frightened at that prospect of being on the same road as me. Uh, but then I said, I think I can be more of a priest with no hands than I ever was with two hands. Archbishop Tutu said, come and work with me in Cape Town. He said, you know, I've got one priest who's blind. I've got one who's deaf. And now one with no hands. Wow. So for one bishop, I was a liability. The other bishop, I was an asset. And that's the kind of person Archbishop Tutu was. He saw that actually I had better qualifications than I have before. And in a way, he's cheered me on the way ever since. Um, and then I realized that not only 23,000 people had a story to tell who went to the Truth Commission, but we all had a story to tell. We'd all been damaged by apartheid. So with a group of friends, I created uh, an institute for healing of memories, seeking to heal the wounds of history, seeking to deal with the psychological, emotional, and spiritual wounds of the past. So just as it was obvious for Afri to say, Archbishop Tutu, be our patron. Equally, when we started the Institute, Archbishop, please would you be um, our patron? Um, and, and incidentally, I was um, last night with a group of Palestinians. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the Palestinian Solidarity Organization in Ireland, because one of the things the Western media is doing at the moment, they're seeking to airbrush out of Archbishop Tutu's history, his profound commitment to the liberation of the Palestinian people. And Archbishop Tutu said when he went, when he went to Palestine, it's worse than, than apartheid. Um, and people are conveniently leaving that part out um, of his history. Where would you uh, like me to go I, from there? I, I, did sorry, notice, I did notice that, and I think we are going to return to that theme because I think that one of the, the more striking aspects of his legacy and his memory for me was that he, he maintained what some people might call a radical perspective right until the end. But I suppose when we really look at it, it needn't be called radical because it's simply the truth. He campaigned on climate change. He, you know, he campaigned on, on Palestine and so many other LGBT rights and so many other issues that are at the time perhaps are considered radical, but really they're what we should be doing. Um, but I, I think there's an example of perhaps as leadership climbs up the whatever ladder it might be going up, it it can often get diluted and become slightly less courageous in its tone would you would you agree he, well, yes often but he never became diluted exactly became exactly stronger and stronger and he was a radical in the sense of going to the roots going to the heart of the matter and i think in a way his view was very simple we are all god's children we all have equal value. So therefore, of course, he was against racism. Of course, he was for the liberation of his people. But then what did he do next? Ha having to some degree achieved the first step of liberation in South Africa, he champions the rights of women in the church. I know there's a few people in Ireland who, who have Catholic tendencies, um, but... <laughs> The Catholic Church will also start ordaining women one of the days, and they'll follow the example of Archbishop Tutu, because he helped our church move towards ordaining women. So we have bishops who are women in our church. Thanks in large measure to Desmond Tutu. But also you made reference, my brother, to the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and of course, in many circles, he was very unpopular when he popularized the rights of the uh, lesbian, gay, transgendered community. Um, but for him, again, it was very simple. In fact, he said, if heaven is homophobic, I don't want to go there. I'd rather go to the other place. And of course, that was very provocative, but it was classic tutu. And then, of course, he wrote another book that said, God is not a Christian. Hello. 
and imagine the shock in some some circles for that of course and again he he was making the point that all the great religious traditions of the world have wisdom in them you know so in south africa he was a champion of the interfaith movement. Um, so, so today we had a memorial and there was an imam speaking, there was a Hindu speaking, and in a sense for the Hindus, for the Muslims in our country, Archbishop Tutu is their father as well, you know, yeah. equally. So in a way he's popularized a vision that as the human family, we cannot live in peace without an interfaith vision. But I think there's something very important that I really want to underline. And that is for him, spirituality and the struggle for justice are two sides of the same coin. He's someone who prayed for hours every day. So we need to understand his commitment to justice came out of his profound spirituality. So while he was acting in the world, he was also praying and meditating and contemplating and and actually it's very remarkable in this week the world instead of talking about the next war or the next lot of armaments we're going to make it's talking about this remarkable human being who had a vision of compassion kindness gentleness and justice with profound spirituality who would have thought that the world's media would be focusing this week so in a way I think it's almost a gift to him in his death that he's helping us focus on what's really important to, to be as a human being, including, of course, he championed uh, the issues of which you, you, Joe referred to, uh, to climate justice um, as well. It's something fundamental. And he also had a great commitment to young people. So people, are, some people in South Africa are saying, it's all over. The last moral compass in the world is gone. Well, maybe one of the last of his generation. Mm -hmm. but there's a new generation of young people who've got fire in their bellies, who are committed to creating and changing the world, who were inspired and nurtured by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Well, thank you so much, Michael. That was a very fitting uh, tribute uh, to share with us. And I think I'd love to to hear you some more another time. I'm sure others agree. I see people sharing in the chat there. We hopefully will get you back either in an online event or in person here in Ireland. And um, perhaps we'll, go, we'll repeat this event in person. Is anybody up for that? We'll have a bit of a party as well. I'll be there, I'll be there, yeah. I'm coming. <laughs> I'll book my ticket on Monday. Excellent, I think we need a bit of music right. and dancing as well. So thanks so much michael i really appreciate you joining us and uh, i wish you well for the coming days and for the funeral all the best Saturday. to everybody Let, let's continue grieving and having gratitude uh for this remarkable human being wish you all well and let's all work for justice in our place in the ways that we can and that's how we say uh tutu we love you by working for justice that'll make him smile in heaven wonderful thanks again michael thank you Okay, folks, so we're going to move along here and um, we're going to go to a little bit of a musical interlude. And then after the music, we have Bulani from Bulani from uh, Massey, who's a great South African activist that we're lucky to have on our island. And then we'll be hearing from Mary Manning. And later on, we've Colin McEnumera, we've Willie and Mary Cardoff, uh, we've Fatin, uh, Sarah Clancy. So lots more in store. And um, so we have, uh, we're going to, I'm going to ask Raj to help me now bring uh, Tommy Sands, a very special song that's, uh, that is being used for AFRI at the moment for a lot of its campaigning and activism. And I think very fitting to this particular event and to the legacy, the memory and to the spirit of Desmond Tutu. So it's about three or four minutes long and then we will be back to you uh, with more great speakers, talkers, poeting, uh, music and more. So Tommy Sands now and Raj is going to help me get that on screen. I've noticed traveling around the countryside a lot of monuments raised praising generals who lead us into war. And very few raised to those who lead us out of war towards peace. The song's dedicated to all those people who do what they do to make the world a better place, more peaceful place, and just place.
for their daughters and sons. I wouldn't hear your music in the pull your paintings down. I wouldn't read your writing and the band you from the town. But I couldn't stop you dreaming the victory you've won. For you sowed the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sowed the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. Weary smile it proudly hides the chain wax on your hands Where you bravely strive to realize the rights of everyone And all your bodies bent and low, a victory you've won Where you sowed the seeds of justice in your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons, in your daughters and your sons so the seeds of justice in your daughters and your sons. I don't know your religion, but one day I heard you pray for a world where everyone can work and children they can play. I know you never got your share of the fruits that you've won. You sowed the seeds of equality in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sowed the seeds of equality in your daughters and your sons. They taunted you in Belfast and they tortured you in Spain. And in that Warsaw ghetto where they tied you up in chains In Vietnam and Chile when they came with tanks and guns Say you sowed the seeds of peace your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons In your daughters and your sons It's there you sowed the seeds of peace play and the writings on the wall and all the dreams you painted can be seen by one and all and now you've got them thinking and the future's just begun and you sow the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons in your daughters and your sons in your daughters and your sons you sow the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. In your daughters and your sons. You sow the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. That's great. Um, thanks so much to Tommy Sands for that wonderful song. And I'm going to ask Joe just momentarily to unmute himself and maybe just continue. Uh, if you could just summarize what you were starting there, Joe, about the Dan Patrick Declaration, because I yeah. think it is very relevant and fitting to this event. Yeah, well, very briefly, it's just it's it's a call um, on governments on these islands to turn away from the path of war and to stop building more weapons and participating in the war machine. And uh, it's a declaration that has been written. It was launched on in Downpatrick by Mairead Maguire. And as we come around to Fela Brigia, we will be asking people to endorse this declaration, to make it clear to our government and uh, the administration of North Ireland as well, that this is not a direction we need to go in. We've, we know uh, what we've been through We've had the great effort for decommissioning, 
decommissioning, which was largely successful. Now we don't need to start creating weapons to feed the war industry further. <clears throat> well said, Joe, and I think it's the it's downpatrickdeclaration.com is the That's website, it. and yeah. a quick Google will find it as well. So thanks, Joe. Um, we'll get you muted again, and uh, we'll move along to our next speaker, and we're going live now to Bulalani Mefiko, uh, and I think you, and I'm going to ask you to start, Bulalani, by um, hope, possibly correcting me if I've mispronounced your name, so that could be a good start. <laughs> Bulalani Mefiko. Mefiko. Uh, can you say that again? <laughs> you won't get the last name. No, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> no. Okay, well, you're, you're very welcome, uh, Vilalani. Um, you're originally from South Africa. You're living in Ireland. You're a spokesperson for Massey. Uh, you're well known for a lot of your activism and campaigning. And Massey, to anyone that doesn't know, is the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland and is particularly vocal around direct provision, which is a horrendous system that... Uh, we've been promised will end by 2024, but is behind schedule. And I mean, this is another issue. I don't know if we want to get too bogged down in it, but uh, I certainly celebrate your uh, activism and particularly the award that you won recently, uh, recognized by the Human Rights Award uh, by the Bar Council, was it? Can you remind me of that? Yeah, it was the Bar Council of Ireland. Um, we were just surprised to receive the award um, because I remember when uh, people started forming Masi uh, back in 2014 in a direct provision center, none of them were thinking about awards or anything like that. And they all wanted to, was to end the system of direct provision um, and to have the right to work, have the right to access to that level, to that level of education, uh, but also just the right to live, uh, to get on with their lives. Uh, people were tired of being in limbo. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the work aspect is one, I think, is one component and, and not everyone perhaps appreciates the severe pressure that people in the direct provision system are living in, uh, not just financially, but psychologically as well. Yeah, yeah, um, it does cause an enormous stress, especially now uh, uh, with the holidays. I mean, if you have children um, in direct provision with expenses, even back to school expenses become insurmountable for a lot of people who aren't allowed to work. Um, and this upper the state, um, uh, the Irish state has actually created a situation where you could have uh, one person in a room who is allowed to work and another person who um, has been in the country for many years um, who isn't allowed to work um, uh, and expected to sit and watch others go on about uh, their day to day lives. And um, uh, it's, it's appalling that actually you still have, in, in, in 2021, you still have uh, uh, states that draw a, 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 a distinction amongst um, uh, an impoverished uh, community, uh, community that's already on the margins of Irish society, that's deliberately placed on the margins of Irish society, which is actually akin um, uh, to what we saw um, uh, in apartheid South Africa, um, where the state deliberately placed uh, black people on the margins uh, by denying them access to the labour market, access to education, access to healthcare, and the rest of it. Can you speak to me about your own uh, background, Bulalani, and particularly um, how Desmond Tutu came into the frame and what perhaps message he gave to you as a young man and uh, how he was seen in the, in the South Africa that you grew up in? I think it's important to situate um, uh, the arch in you know, the environment in which he wrote. Um, uh, especially in the 1980s in South Africa. Um, I was born in apartheid South Africa. Um, I grew up in, an, uh, in a Bantustan, um, which might be, um, which has been to uh, the Archbishop has actually compared to the situation in Palestine, in the West Bank, and uh, uh, the blockade in, in Gaza. And so we grew up being stripped of uh, a South African citizenship. I wasn't a, citizen, a South African citizen when I was born. Um, uh, uh, purely because of my race, um, uh, for no other reason. Um, my parents um, uh, were split up. Uh, uh, my mother lived in, uh, uh, in the Eastern Cape and uh, uh, her husband lived in Bumalanga where he was working and he needed travel documents um, uh, uh, to go to, uh, to Bumalanga in order to be. Same for my grandparents. Um, uh, my grandfather had uh, siblings in Cape Town. He needed a travel document to travel 
um, uh, to Cape Town needed permission from the apartheid state in order to go and see uh, 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 his siblings in Cape Town. Um, I think Palestinian people would relate to that. And so there was quite a lot of hubla who when the Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, uh, compared uh, 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 his experience when he visited Palestine. Um, he compared what he saw there um, to what we experienced in, uh, in apartheid South Africa. So I think it's very important that we situate him right where he actually began, uh, where he wrote um, uh, to fail, if you like, um, because that's when he actually started, uh, he was be, uh, uh, being more visible internationally in the 1980s when South Africa had a state of emergency where people were, uh, were disappearing, people were being tortured. Um, there were quite a lot of uh, killings. Uh, restrictions were imposed, like indoor gatherings, freedom of movement, public gatherings, the press, political organizing. Um, even the South African Council of Churches uh, was bombed, um, and the Archbishop was uh, uh, heavily involved with that. He had served as an, ex as an executive in the South African Council of Churches. Um, they were bombed in, the, in, 19, in 1988 by the apartheid state um, uh, for their activism for their campaigning against apartheid. And so we grew up uh, in, uh, in an environment where we could see who was visible. Um, the arch was very dominant figure. Like you will see now in Cape Town, um, a lot of public buildings are lit up in purple. You always had the archbishop wearing that uh, purple uh, robe or or whatever church uh, regalia that he normally is famous for that purple uh, 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 color. Um, uh, and that's why buildings are now lit up in Cape Town in honor of him, um, uh, because he became uh, that symbol uh, for a lot of South Africans. We looked up to him. Um, uh, I went to the University of the Western Cape and he had served as a chancellor for the University of the Western Cape for about 25 years. So we looked forward to graduation um, at the university where we're going to be kept by the arch because of uh, his stage, but also his campaigning. Um, it was hard to miss um, uh, uh, his campaigning. You were simply not paying attention if you went uh, seeing the archbishop um, uh, campaigning, whether it's for uh, the right to termination of pregnancy, especially in an environment where there was quite a lot of conservatism, um, where people who uh, were uh, a lot of public figures were very uh, reluctant to speak out um, uh, on those particular issues, including uh, the rights of LGBT plus people. I remember when we were, to, uh, South Africa was talking about, uh, 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 there was a bill, uh, the civil unions bill, which was to uh, 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 allow same-sex people to enter into marriage. And there was quite a lot of homophobic rhetoric um, uh, being flaunted by people in leadership positions. Um, and the arch came out um, uh, publicly speaking. Um, he actually gave um, a lot of young gay people like me um, a hope. Uh, because it was a very uh, difficult environment. I mean, LGBTQ plus people still get killed in South Africa. Um, uh, that's how difficult it was back then in 2005 when um, uh, the Arch uh, 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 took up that mantle of campaigning. Um, uh, but he didn't stop there, and it wasn't even a start for him. Um, uh, the Triangle Project in Cape Town uh, would tell you that he has been their contributor uh, for the past 20 years, I mean, financially contributing um, to an LGBTQ plus organization for the past 20 years. And so um, uh, he didn't just preach, um, uh, he actually converted his words into action. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one thing that we will always remember the arch for. Um, uh, his most famous intervention, would, uh, uh, might, some people might know uh, this particular people in South Africa, was when he stopped the necklacing of a man who had been declared a traitor. And necklace in South Africa is when uh, a person gets uh, bent with a tire um, on their neck and they are bent alive. Um, uh, and the Archbishop managed to uh, calm uh, a huge crowd that was going to commit that act. And so uh, uh, if you understand uh, uh, how a South African uh, crowd behaves when it's paying for blood, you would appreciate how difficult um, uh, and how challenging it must be to actually uh, uh, stop them. And only the arch could do that because of the respect that he commanded, um, not just in South Africa, but abroad. And so um, uh, it is uh, uh, a 
I wouldn't say sad that he, uh, uh, we've lost him because he was a, an added uh, campaigner for the right to die. He spoke out publicly uh, uh, campaigning. I mean, many of the issues that he's actually campaigned on, uh, whether you talk about Iraq, whether you talk about Palestine, are issues that a lot of uh, uh, public figures in South Africa tend to shy away from. Um, I, and he was that voice. Um, uh, uh, and he, his role will certainly be felt. Uh, his absence will certainly be felt. I think you, um, you you certainly hold that uh, determination and that commitment, that courage that um, he stood for, uh, Bulani and your colleagues and comrades in Massey, Donna and Lucky and everyone else. And I think as we head into a new year that we can hopefully rally this community here tonight, particularly around the issues of racism and direct provision, which is in itself institutionally racist. So I'd encourage everyone to check out Massey uh, online. It's Massey.ie, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and you've got some nice t-shirts and everything that people can buy for next Christmas. Get the presents in early. Not, not yet. The not at the moment, okay. No, <laughs> anyway, no. you've certainly got a donate button, so I'll encourage that. Okay, thanks so much for joining us and look forward to All seeing right, you again. Sure. Take care, bye-bye. Okay, so we're going to keep moving along, folks. Um, I'm really grateful to everyone who's joined us, all the uh, everyone who's joined in on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Thanks for all your comments and chat, and thanks in particular to the speakers, to the poets, and to the musicians. So people may be familiar with uh, what became a seminal moment in anti-apartheid history when um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was on his way to collect the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo and a small organization in Dublin, Ireland called AFRI and a man called Joe Murray with others uh, got involved and helped arrange a meeting of what was what were deemed to be called what were called the Dunn store strikers at the time to meet with Archbishop Tutu and it went on to change the face of the struggle to ultimately popularize and internationalize the struggle. At the time, the Dunn store striker were, strikers were young women in Dublin who refused to handle what was called the fruits of apartheid, the literal fruits from the apartheid state. And we're going to be hearing now from one of the Dunn store strikers, Mary Manning. But before we do, we're going to look at a tiny, like a one minute piece of video footage from around that time, which I'll ask Raj to help bring up on screen now. Thanks, Raj. I would, I would, I would wish that other people would be able to support them. And um, they have made their point, yes. So do you think it's now time to give up the strike? Well, I don't know whether you should say to give it up, but I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I would have liked to see a groundswell of support uh, coming their way, but they certainly have made their point and at very great cost to themselves. And this is what I would wish to commend them for. I'm, 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 I, I must say that they are quite remarkable young people. Are you disappointed that the Catholic Church in Ireland uh, hasn't come out in support of the workers? I, I would have thought that uh, all churches um, would have seen this as a, as a great opportunity to align themselves with the cause for justice for the voiceless and the oppressed. And um, I don't want to be critical of um, uh, our sister churches um, because I'm not aware of all the facts uh, in, in, in the situation. Uh, I would have thought, though, that uh, this was a tremendous opportunity for, for the churches to be the voice of the voiceless. Well, maybe after hearing what Bishop Tudor is after saying, he might come round and give us the moral right that we deserve not to handle the goods. So you're obviously uh, delighted at the, the whole proceedings this morning? Yeah, absolutely thrilled. <laughs> it's great. For Bishop Tutu to congratulate us and be proud of what we're doing in Dublin, you know, it was really great to hear that sort of support. Brilliant. So that was um, some of the footage of the time in history. And now we're going to hear from one of those strikers, Mary Manning. How are you feeling this evening, hearing all of these stories and, and seeing that footage? It's, it just brings back so many memories for us. Um, I mean, like the strike was in 1984, so it's quite a while ago. But one of the first people down and the first people down onto the picket line were Afri. Um, who I hadn't heard of before. 
Um, and then to see um, the footage of Bishop Tutu in London, when we met him in London, that was such a turning point for the strike. And it really did give us a lot more support than we had had. We were on strike at that stage for nearly six months. Um, and we had little or no support, but it brought a lot of attention to the, to the strike. Um, I suppose at that stage, like there was, it's a different media, it wasn't uh, instant media like it is now. So it took a long time for information to get somewhere. But people knew who Bishop Tutu at the time was. They knew he was going to collect his Nobel Peace Prize. So it was well known. And then for, for someone like him to actually want to meet us and to, like he said, commend what we did, it was it was just such a such a turning point for the strike. Yeah, and he, he certainly did remember you, as did Nelson Mandela, and I believe you were invited to Nelson Mandela's inauguration, is that correct? But no, the funeral, we went at the funeral. Oh, it was funeral, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I actually was in, living in Australia but when Nelson Mandela came to Ireland, so I never got the chance to meet him, unfortunately. But, um, and then I suppose the, the second turning point for the strike for us came from Bishop, Archbishop Tutu as well, because... He sent an invitation for us to go to South Africa in 1985 and um, we, we uh, did huge collections in Dublin City and got the money to get to go and we were stopped at the airport in London initially and then when we got to South Africa we were held for eight hours and then under armed guard and then just turned back and sent back on the next flight so we had a day trip to South Africa, <laughs> but it, it had the opposite effect of what they thought I think it was mm -hmm. going to do because they didn't want to, uh, to kind of um, advertise what was going on there. But I don't know what they thought, like we were shop workers, I don't know what, what they thought we were going to do, but what it did was make people kind of start questioning, well, what's going on? What do they want to hide that they don't want to let these shop workers in? Yeah. So it was another huge turning point in the strike meeting yeah. Bishop, Bishop due to. Can you see the parallels yourself these days, Mary, when, when people uh, talk about what's going on in Palestine? Does it bring, does it make you think about that moment that where you had the decision to act? Yeah, I mean, I think it's this huge parallel between what's happening in, in Palestine now. And I think it is kind of very, they're very similar situations. I mean, you can't kind of look at the two situations and not see the similarities, I think. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's, it's um, although we, at the time, we didn't think that it was, it was, a huge and um, what we were doing was a huge thing we just wanted the moral right not to handle the south african goods but it turned into something much bigger and i suppose little actions can grow and i think that's what people can take from that like it's, it doesn't have to start off being a huge a huge action but you don't know where it's going to take you yeah absolutely mary i know you've written a book can you um tell people the name of the book so that uh, <laughs> if people want to find out more about that time in history and i know there's also footage on youtube and elsewhere but can you remind us of the name of the book, please? It's called Striking Back. Striking Back. You yeah. know, all good bookshops and all of that. So <laughs> please do check out Mary's book. Uh, Mary, thanks so much for joining us this evening. And uh, look forward to seeing you at the physical event whenever we get to have exactly. it. Exactly. So, yeah, sounds like good. Again. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mary, and thanks, everyone, for staying with us. We're coming towards uh, the final segment of the event. and. Uh, I'm just trying to keep an eye on the comments and I've text messages and WhatsApp messages and I think my brain's going to have blow up here. I have so much electronic communication coming at me, but uh, I think we're, we're, are we okay? Yeah, I can hear you shouting back. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> um, okay, so next up, uh, I'm going, we're going to, uh, I'm actually in Lahinch County Clare and we're going, I think, to the north of County Clare, if she is there. Uh, she may be in a different part of Clare, but a good friend of mine uh, who is a well-known poet and activist, Sarah Clancy. How are you, Sarah? Hi, Rory. Thanks very much for inviting me. Oh, thanks. Great to have you here. And um, do you have any um, anything you'd like to share, Sarah, before you do your poem around what you're hearing this evening? Sure, I, I, think, I think it's just, uh, it's uh, amazing to be here to celebrate the life of such a joyous and courageous uh, man. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're all moved um, just by, by, you know, ju just by having had his presence in our life in the background of various struggles that we were involved in. I think we're all the better for him. Um, I, I've, I have an extreme sense of imposter syndrome here, but just to say that I have huge admiration for him 
Um, and I think, you know, some of the things that are dear to me, such as LGBTQ rights, feminism, the uh, struggles of the Palestinian people, the Rossport Five and their campaign, the Dunn Stores workers, Desmond Tutu was there. None of these things are to do particularly with South Africa, but he was there somewhere on what I consider to be the side of justice in all of those. So it's a real honor um, to be here this evening. Absolutely. Thanks, Sarah. So, um, and actually, you're got, you mentioned Rossport. So next up, we're going live to Rossport to Willie and Mary Cardiff. And I know you're very active in that campaign. And I, I'm sure that um, some of your poem speaks to the wider issues around that. So I'll hand it over to you now to the, for your poem. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, this uh, this poem, no, no good poem should need an explanation, but this poem needs a slight explanation. And it's a poem, one of the things that being involved and learning about people in struggles for social justice uh, made me consider over the years is my position as a person kind of sheltered and privileged and from one of the wealthy countries in the world. And it's very hard not to be lured back into supporting the status quo. They're waiting for us all the time. So this is a poem for everyone who's sheltered like me to remind ourselves it's called Problems with Authority. And it's, it was inspired by, I don't know if people are familiar with the Normalistas, which were indigenous teachers movement in Mexico. And in 2014, 43 of them were disappeared uh, pretty much by the state. And graffiti went up around Mexico at the time. And the graffiti said, no se olvido, fue el estado. More or less, don't forget, it was the state that did it. And so this is a poem about that and many other things. Arms into torso, my limbs melted. Long before, before I heard of Tunisia, of Ben Ali or Mohamed Bouazizi, before I knew anything about economics, I twisted in distressed white bed linen, whilst in the cane fields my skin wheeled from Irish overseer's whips. In dreams, I was spread eagled over hot car metal on a million occasions, had my hands up before Ferguson, before Michael Brown was gunned down, I dreamt it. And in Bagram, old England's techniques made me so homesick that when I woke in Abu Ghraib, facing Lindy England's lens, I almost missed my blindfold. Since before thumb sucking finished, I took part in progress, or at least that's what the bosses called it, when my young fingers blistered in NAFTA sweatshops, making toys for other children, while my mother risked her cheap life walking home through Juarez, where your worst prospect is La Policia. In Ayotzinapa, I suffered from petrol and black fumes, but I found my grave chock full with corpses, showing signs of torture. And because the cemeteries and city dumps were filled already with bloody Sunday victims, with the locked out children of the Nakba, with Ken Sarawiwa and his many, many sisters, they left me faceless on the highway in Chilapa. And I was not surprised. I expect such things from armies. Sometimes in my darkened bedroom, I speak to IYY about whether art matters, but he doesn't ever answer. And I feel the walls close in. I hear wolf whistles from the yard. I know the feeling of gravel on my cheek as I lie prone in an all-male prison waiting for what might or might not happen. I know the sound of uniforms rustling, of boots unquestioningly marching. And when I wake, I think of Chelsea Manning. In times of rapid eye movement, I get momentarily euphoric, dreaming of the just before death moments of defiance of fist raised by Carlo Giuliani, by Remy Frass and Rachel Corey, and how they stand there like slim silhouettes while tanks bear down in a thousand Tiananmen's. But it only lasts a few seconds before I'm disturbed by the thud of the coffin lids shutting. And then I sit up and throw the quilt off as if it caused my suffocation as if it caused these recurrent nightmares, when in truth my biggest fear belongs to daylight, and it's this. Despite the history of overseers, of all those generals, despite the history of authority figures, despite Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the fact that I can't list their victims, my biggest fear is how still and all I want to trust them. And I'm writing to remind myself that all through history, it's the authorities who've done the worst things. Thanks very Sorry, much. Sorry, Sarah, I was nice. muted there for a moment. That was really powerful. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I think um, it's it's a very fitting um, to, to 
uh, introduction to our next guest. So we go live to uh, Ross Port to Willie and Mary Kerduff, and I'll invite them on screen now. And um, Willie and Mary, you're very welcome. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? So, Hi. folks, um, um, many people here will re recall the uh, struggle against the, the Shell uh, gas pipeline in North Mayo. And at the time, uh, Willie went through um, a pretty devastating and brutal beating. I hope you don't mind me saying, Willie. And um, Archbishop Thank Desmond you. Tutu was one of the... Um, I suppose the more prominent people that called for a national and indeed a, an international investigation, which at the time, I think Fianna Fáil and the Greens were in government and it, the investigation did not happen. And I suppose I'm just wondering how it was for you, Willie, to hear that level of support and what it meant for you at the time. It was great to get his support. Like, you know, it was such a, it was such a, shock to, to us to get that support like no we didn't expect you know because as far as we were concerned our own catholic church and that had turned their back on us as such you know so like to see to see a man from south africa come into the very end of mayo to give us support was a huge huge benefit to us and a huge bonus to us mm. you know the i the only thing i ever regret is that i had i did, hadn't got a chance to meet him you know, we were supposed to have met him, but through politics, I would say it was, you know, it, it didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I looked forward to meeting him. He, we were supposed to have a meeting with him, but it never took place. But I'd say that would have been a, a, a great, great evening of chat. Yeah, it would Mary, happen, do you yeah. have any uh, particular memory of that time that you'd like to share? Well, I suppose a prominent person like Bishop Desmond Tutu to extend to be named in in, to be named in support of us, we call us ordinary people down here in the West End of Mayo. It was a great achievement. And every time you heard his name mentioned from then on, you kind of thought, oh, this person was so good to support us. And he was such a prominent person around the world for peace and for the injustices that went on everywhere that you felt honoured, honoured really that, that he was part of our support. And sadly, it fell on deaf ears, his his call um, in this country. But I mean, that's that's the way it goes. I, we, we expected as much from our own country, but at least he got it out there. And, you know, meeting everybody tonight on screen as, as it is, um, Michael Lapsley came down to Terrace to meet us a few years ago. Uh, Clay, um, Sarah, every, I'd met Mary before. And of course, Joe is, was a, is and is and was a right hand person. Afri was such a support mm. to us, and you know, listening to Joe earlier on talking about the arms deal, you know that that now we 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 start to make them in our own holy Irish country. You kind of say to yourself, the effort that's gone around the world to to save people from COVID, and you know to save everybody, and here we're now going to produce a, a gun. To, it's going to kill someone somewhere. Mm. It's it's sad. It's it's really sad how this world is thinking. Yeah, and, and I, I think it's a, it's another reminder to um not just honor the legacy, but to continue the legacy of, yeah. of fighting for justice, fighting yeah. for peace, mm -hmm. and yeah. fighting for rights through nonviolence and yeah. community and action. And I want to also celebrate you both and honor you both for the activism and standing up as you did to one of the world's biggest fossil fuel companies and you did so over many years with your own community and you went on to inspire me and countless others not just in Ireland and around the world and are perhaps one of the the main reasons that we've been relatively successful in withholding or preventing the fracking industry coming to Ireland was the work that you did against all the odds against media demonization against attacks against vic being victimized in the way that you did or uh, being attacked in the way that you did. So I think, um, you know, a lot of people uh, I'm seeing in the comments now want to, to say thank you and have great gratitude for the work that you did and the message that you shared tonight. So thanks again for sharing those memories. Well, we Ta wouldn't have been able to no. do any of it without the support and, of Afri and Desmond. Thanks to Afri and to you all for, you know, it's a, ple it's a, it's a pleasure being, you know, with you tonight. You know, it's just, it's bring back memories and faces and you name it. You know, our struggle was was terrible, like, you know, it was just, 
un unbelievable. Yeah. We it was indeed, stay. Willie, and, and it's not forgotten, and, and it's good to see yeah. that there's a bit of media coverage now, and I, I believe you might be doing a radio interview in a couple of days. So let's keep the, that memory alive and the message alive as well. So thanks and again, just folks. Say, and, just to finish off and say yeah, that sorry. we, you know, that Desmond Tutu now deserves peace. Absolutely. And it's to keep up his good work. Very well said, very well said, Mary. And I think let's just even create a little pause in his memory to to give that sense of gratitude and to honor honor the memory of him so we'll just take a 30 second pause here Lovely. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Willie. Take thank care, you both. Take care. Thanks again. So we're almost there, folks. We're coming towards the final stretch. And um, we uh, have talked a lot this evening about Palestine, and I think uh, rightly so. It remains perhaps one of the uh, most urgent um, issues and causes that deserves our att attention. And I think it was brought up at the beginning that it has been somewhat censored and erased from the media coverage and reflection around Archbishop Tutu, and that he was very much vocal around the call to action on Palestine. So with that in mind, we're gonna go now to Fatin, uh, Fatin Al-Tamimi uh, from the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign, and hopefully get her up on screen. Fatin, lovely to see you. Hi, Rory. Fatin, can you, you tell me uh, how you're feeling tonight and um, perhaps, you know, just thinking about the legacy and the struggle against apartheid and perhaps what might have seemed like hopeless at, at a particular moment in time when faced with the great might and great injustice of oppression. Um, but now to look to Palestine and look at the work that we all need to do together, not just Palestinians, but us in Ireland, people in South Africa and internationally. Thank you very much uh, for AFRI, uh, for inviting me, allowing me to speak with the, the fantastic speakers uh, who spoke before me. Uh, I wish I had uh, personal memories <laughs> with this one too, too but uh, unfortunately I don't. It's just that my uh, huge admiration for him uh, for his uh, support and his uh, for uh, all his work uh, with uh, his departure of course we humanity has lost a moral giant who dedicated his entire life uh, in fight against apartheid racism and discrimination and of course he uh, showed the bravest of solidarity where, with the palestinian people uh, still against the uh, apartheid uh, israel uh, so we, as Palestinians, we uh, lost a powerful advocate for uh, our uh, rights. Uh, Artichok Tutu was an outspoken in, in our case, uh, cause uh, and uh, critics of Israeli occupation in Palestine and the siege of Gaza. Uh, actually mentioning Gaza, this week we commemorate the, uh, one of the massacres uh, uh, um was uh, on uh, done uh, by israel uh, attack uh, on uh, 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 december uh, 27th of december uh, 2008 uh, when uh, israel uh, killed uh, more one than 1600 palestinian people in besieged gaza uh, more than 350 of them children uh, this year alone, uh, Israel killed uh, more than 70 children. Um, uh, I think 55 of them were in besieged Gaza again. 
so he he spoke about that the Gaza and he drew parallels with between Israel occupation and uh, apartheid in South Africa and I, I'll, I'll quote here uh, what's being done to the Palestinians as uh, at checkpoints for us it's the kind of thing we experience in South Africa uh, we have visited Israel Palestine on a number of occasions and every time have been struck by the similarities with the South, South African apartheid regime. Uh, and another quote from him, the separate, uh, the separate roads and areas for Palestinians, the humiliation at uh, roadblocks and checkpoints, the evictions and home demolitions, uh, end of quote. So um, for, for him to, uh, so in some of his quotes as well, he mentioned that uh, uh, how it's even worse than uh, South Africa, uh, what's happening in Palestine. Uh, and understanding the similarities of the power uh, dynamics in the, the two settler colonial uh, societies, Tutu was quick to endorse the Palestinian civil society call for boycott, divestment and sanction which is the movement that, uh, that's uh, uh, the, the powerful, peaceful moment, movement at the moment, which we ask everybody to endorse and follow, uh, which is the B B BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction, the movement that aims for the Palestinians' freedom, justice, equality, and the right of return. Uh, he often lent uh, his support directly to the BDS campaign around the world, publicly and privately. Uh, which gave the movement a massive moral boost uh, and convinced many other influencer figures uh, worldwide to follow suit. Uh, and uh, he could, uh, there's another quote as, as well from him about the boycott of and sanction. He, he said, uh, I quote, those who continue to do business with Israel, who continue to uh, uh, a sense of normalcy in Israeli society and doing the, uh, are doing the people of Israel and Palestine a disservice that uh, they are cont contributing to the um, uh, per perpetuation of a profoundly unjust state quo. End of quote. But of course, uh, sadly, as uh, uh, other speakers mentioned, the international community uh, are playing blind to this. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing anything to hold Israel accountable for what the, the daily war crimes they commit against the Palestinian people. I think that that's another reminder why the, the likes of the Occupied Territories Bill and... Exactly, why... that's what I got to say, that our government here shamely, uh, shamefully uh, still didn't... Uh, 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 act upon this uh, bill and uh, to continue to block uh, the uh, Occupied Territories Bill, despite being passed by both uh, houses of the Arctis, which is something we have to, to work harder here and uh, ask our government to, to pass because the Israeli uh, illegal settlers at the moment, they are uh, daily um, um, harassing and killing and uh, demolishing the, and uh, attacking the Palestinian people in uh, in their villages and their in their homes. Uh, so that's something we really uh, we need to highlight and we need the support of the uh, Irish people. Uh, and uh, as Nelson Mandela uh, quoted, that uh, we we won't be free until Palestinians uh, are free. Yeah. So to, to end up with, with saying inspired by Desmond Tutu, by Steve Biko, by Nelson Mandela, by Ronnie uh, in, uh, and, and other South African giants in the struggle for justice. And also inspired, of course, by the Irish uh, uh, people here in Ireland uh, and uh, inspired by the Irish uh, dance stores uh, strikers who uh, played a small role, but made it was major to end uh, yeah. apartheid uh, in South Africa. Africa. So we, we, inspired by all these, we need to continue uh, the struggle and uh, keep uh, Nansa, uh, Mandela, uh, keep uh, uh, Tutu's, uh, Desmond Tutu's legacy uh, and his fire uh, uh, lighting and uh, 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 fight for justice, freedom and equality for Palestinian peoples, uh, as well as for everybody else. 
because as we say we want to be free until everybody is uh, free. Thank, and the Palestinians thank you so free. much and uh, i see somebody there there's in the chat here there's somebody talking about a, a vigil in ennis tomorrow uh, tomorrow afternoon it and encourage people to have vigils and protests and rallies and boycotts and everything else Actually, yeah that's the a commemoration uh, i've mentioned because this week oh, yeah. we commemorated so tomorrow new year's eve usually the island Bridge, has signed right? a liturgy campaign do uh, vigils around the country uh, we have branches everywhere around the country so anybody who can uh, do we usually we do the, we do it on bridges because yeah. uh, bridges to 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 build bridges between us and the palestinians that we feel with them and we are they're not alone with we with them so uh, in happening bridge in, uh, in dublin and in in ennis in uh, i can't remember to be it's honest a, now but your ipsc.net is that dot correct ie dot ie I okay so i'm putting that into the chat IE. right now okay ips oh sorry i put the wrong numbers in my brain's starting to go here ipsc.ie <laughs> ireland yes. palestine solidarity, solidarity campaign. campaign so please, please check that us. out folks yes thank you so much fatin Thank you, everybody. Thanks for Thank joining you us for tonight. Support. And thanks for sharing that call to action. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are at the end, but not quite the end, because we have one of Ireland's most stunning uh, uh, and a stunning musicians, but I was going to say something about his fine hair because COVID is doing wonders for his hair. <laughs> He'll give out to me now in a minute, but uh, he you know we truly are privileged to have him and he's a great supporter of Palestine and so many other issues and causes. Uh, but before we get to Colin McAnumra, I'm just going to invite Joe momentarily back on stream for a quick hello, goodbye. And before I get Joe, I want to make an appeal for AFRI. I'm a friend and supporter of AFRI. I'm not a staff member or anything like that. AFRI in many ways is a, is a community or a network of action. And I just know from looking around and just getting a sense of things that, and just it, it's a fact of life that organizations that often take on the harder issues or what are seen are the harder issues um, often struggle for funding. So therefore your donations that everyone who has chipped in while registering and after for this event, it does hugely matter, particularly anyone who feels inclined to do direct debits. Uh, it's afri.ie forward slash donate or just get in touch with the team. Uh, it's Joe and Larissa are the main team there and they will help uh, figure out some ideas and they've great calendars and other CDs and stuff for sale. So please do what you can to support them throughout the year. And with that in mind, I want to just thank everybody who's participated, all the speakers, the poetry, the music. It's been fantastic. I'm not going to name all the names because I will make a mistake, but it's hugely appreciated and I appreciate all the comments that have come in tonight, all the support, all the support in social media. And uh, I'll just let Joe share his, his thanks as well. Yeah, well, very briefly, I think you've said it all, Rory, but, you know, um, you started off with the word grief and gratitude, and <clears throat> I think that's very much part of this evening, but certainly gratitude to for the life of Desmond Tutu and the inspirational uh, way that he uh, has, you know, taken on up so many causes. And um, and it, there's also a great hope in the people who have joined, and, you know, the, these we are the people who must carry the legacy forward, we and others. But uh, but but we can do that. We must do that. And you know, it looked like apartheid could never be overthrown. It was so victory is possible, and we we keep on going. And thank you very much to everybody. Fair Bua. <clears throat> thanks, Joe, and thanks to Raj for his great work behind the scenes. So I'm going to invite uh, Colm onto the screen now, um, and. Now you get to see the lovely hair for yourself. Um, Thanks, look at Rory. that hair, it's class. <laughs> How are you, Colm? You're joining us from Wexford, from the Magic Room. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 morning now. I'm on the I was the Desmond Tutu. So I'm um, very honoured to be here to play for you all and to honour uh, Desmond Tutu. And it's been a great and uh, great to to listen to all the contributors. Thanks, Colin. So this is a this is a piece I'm going to play, uh, which is I thought apt. The only piece I could think of playing is um, a piece I wrote while visiting Israel and Palestine back in 2018, and it's um, it's called the Minbar of Saladin, and it arrived 
between Nablus and Ramleh and came together in Jerusalem. So A stunning column absolutely stunning thank you so much uh, absolute fitting way to end this very special event and good night everyone and thank you to everyone who's joined us i'm very happy to have been efri's patron along with my wife leah for many years i've been impressed with the work of efri since i first came in contact with the organization in 1984 I was invited to Ireland by Afri that year the same year as the famous and inspirational anti-apartheid strike by the young workers at Dan's stores to please these courageous young people had gone on strike to have their right to refuse to handle the fruits of apartheid respected it was no surprise to me 
that Efri stood four square behind these young strikers throughout the course of their long and eventually victorious strike action. I've been hosted by Efri on a number of subsequent visits to Ireland and have kept in touch with their activities over the years. I'm impressed by their unwavering and long-standing commitment to justice and peace throughout that time. They have persevered in supporting the struggles of many oppressed peoples throughout the world. As well as supporting the anti party struggle, they have worked in solidarity with the peoples of Latin America, the Philippines, and East Timor. They supported the people of Ogoni before, during, and after the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and his colleagues. And when this reality came home to their own backyard, they supported and continue to support the people of Ross Sport in County Mayo in their admirable struggle against Shell. Their commemoration of the Great Famine in Ireland is not about self-pity or nostalgia, but about applying the lessons of that awful experience to the world we live in today. Every also consistently highlights the obscenity of the arms race. The wastage of resources on weapons while so many go hungry in our world. They are now working in partnership with a sister organization on the borders of Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia in tackling the issues of conflict and climate change. What I find unique about EFRI is the way in which they link the local with the global. It is often easy to be concerned about things far away. And of course, this is extremely important. But it is equally important to identify and name the same abuses of power happening in our own backyard. This is something EFRI has never shirked from doing, and I salute them for that. I believe that groups like EFRI should be supported and encouraged because such independent voices are more essential than ever in our world today.